This is Christopher Cernike hosting Episode 7 of Season 4 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Nick Ligori. Nick obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Colorado State University. And interestingly enough, he and I both went to Bangor Area School District. Nick is an avocational researcher into biblical history and creation science. And he's the author of the book Echoes of Ararat. Echoes of Ararat has a foreword written in it by Ken Ham, the president of Answers in Genesis, and is a collection of over 300 flood legends from North and South America. Nick has researched tribes and nations all across the world, seeking to discover and document what they believe about their ancient history. In Echoes of Ararat, Nick demonstrates the sheer ubiquity of tribal traditions of the flood, that there are indeed hundreds of these historical accounts across the Western Hemisphere and indeed across the world. Traditions not just of any flood, but the Genesis flood, based on specific matching details. Nick argues that this confirms the historical reliability and authority of Genesis, and furthermore, that the record of the flood recorded in Genesis is the original, authentic account that the record in Genesis is not dependent on ancient Near Eastern myths, but that Moses, the author of Genesis, had access to the accounts of the patriarchs, including Joseph and Jacob and even Noah himself. Nick's book, Echoes of Ararat, is available in the description for purchase, along with his other biographical information. And now, without further ado, good morning, Nick. How was your day and how are you doing? I'm doing well, Christopher. Thanks for having me. Two guys from Bangor, Pennsylvania. Who would have thought? <laughs> Yeah, it's really awesome to have a fellow Bangorian on the program, Nick. I mean, I never would have thought that, you know, you and I, we both went to Bangor and then here we are together. Both of us are interested in creation science. And this week, we're going to be looking at a current topic from PBS. It's a bit of an older article. It's from 2020, but it's called A Flood of Myths and Stories. This article went through several flood stories from the Aztecs, the Greeks, the Chinese, etc., and it summarized each of the flood stories by saying, Flood stories pervade hundreds of cultures, and there are striking similarities to many of the accounts. It seems that at least some of these stories could be based upon actual events. Geologists have proposed the possibility of a great flood in the Middle East at the end of the last ice age, which was about 7,000 years ago. At that time, the Black Sea was a freshwater lake surrounded by farmlands. The hypothesis is that the European glaciers melted, and the Mediterranean Sea overflowed with a force that was 200 times greater than Niagara Falls. That would be an incredibly fast-moving wall of flood water. And there's physical evidence that supports this theory, including Stone Age structures under the Black Sea. And so, Nick, what do you think about this article's theory about flood story origins. Yeah, I think the Black Sea flood happened. That's supported by archeological and geological evidence. I also believe it's consistent with the Genesis flood as the aftermath of that flood, uh, the world slowly going back to equilibrium in this recovery phase. But did that happen? That's a separate question from, is the Black Sea flood the inspiration for these flood stories that match Genesis in so many particulars? And that I do not accept. Uh, and that's where the bait and switch comes in. It's like, well, you, you believe in the, blood, the Black Sea flood, right? Yes. Well, then you must surely agree that it's the inspiration for these flood stories. No. When we, it, and, and the question is this, can the Black Sea flood account for these flood traditions that we find across the Near East, not only there, but Asia and indeed all parts of the world that match Genesis on so many particulars, the old man uh, being forewarned by God, a flood is coming. Build a, a great boat, take your family aboard, take animals, uh, the, the flood coming, the ark rising with the waters, the 
arc eventually landing on a mountain, uh, the raven, the dove, uh, going down and repopulating the earth, the sacrifice to God, the rainbow, uh, a tower of battle after that. So can the Black Sea flood account for these specific similarities with Genesis? No, it cannot. Can the view that the Genesis flood is true and tribes all around the world remember that flood? And after the Tower of Babel, they, they wrote stories and traditions about it. Yes, that can account for these traditions. Nick, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that article. And we're actually now going to take a look at your book, Echoes of Ararat. So in Echoes of Ararat, you were looking at flood legends from around the world and comparing them to the Bible's account of the Genesis flood. So what do you think about these other flood stories? Can you describe the different flood legends of the world and how they compare to the Bible's account? Yeah, and I'm going to give several examples in a couple of minutes, uh, just as a, a backdrop. So it's been known for a long time that tribes and nations all over the world have legends and written accounts of the flood the, in such similar terms to Genesis. I mentioned this particulars. And this, this is a new thing. It's in fact, Josephus, a first century Jew, he, he writes that um, all writers of barbarian histories make mention of this flood and of this ark. And he cites several of them and he alludes to others. Uh, so it's been known for a long time. I, I came across this subject. I was intrigued and I thought, let me, let me research this. Flood traditions all around the world that match Genesis. That's fascinating. So I went out and I got what books I could to, to learn what I could about this. And and I learned some things, but I came to the point of realizing that these aren't documented as, as well as they ought to be. And I thought that someone would have, would have written something that would document all these. Uh, but so I saw a need. And, you know, Christopher, we've got, we've got PhD scientists in creation doing, doing outstanding work in geology, archaeology, uh, genetics. And you interviewed one, uh, Dr. Jeanson, last week about genetics. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a PhD, but all I did was I saw a need or to document these traditions. And, and so I began, what I was really trying to get at is what, how strong is the evidence? Uh, do they in fact confirm the Genesis flood? I want to go back to early first Hannah sources and see what did these tribes in fact believe? Uh, and I want early information, um, not secondhand sources. And so when we have these, these original sources from credible authors and tribal elders, we can have, have a level of confidence that this is what they believed about, about the flood, about some other things from uh, the, the beginning of the world. And, and I don't want to take too much credit for this. I've, I've had many people help me and uh, authors, people have come before me, done great work. I, and I always tell this story. I was reading a history of one tribe, I think it was the Cherokee, and, and I've had this feeling other, other times too. And I'm reading, I'm like, hold on, that, that sounds awfully similar to the Genesis flood. Let me take off my glasses and breathe. Read that. Uh, no, I read it right. That's the Genesis flood. Okay, what is the Genesis flood doing in the Cherokee Nation's history? What is the Genesis flood doing in the Apache Nation's history? What is the Genesis flood doing in the Inuit Nation's history uh, of the tribes of Canada, go down to Mexico, South America, uh, the Tupinamba tribe, uh, Aztecs, Mayans, and all these places? I'm researching Asia right now. What is the Genesis flood doing in China, in Korea? And in fact, Secularists like to say that, well, this part of the world knows nothing, knows flood. That's not true. And that's part of what I'm doing in documenting these things, uh, going back to the original sources. I've been blown away by how strong the evidence is. Man, I, at first I thought, you know, maybe I can get 100, 100 tribes. And here we are, you know, upwards of 330 from North and South America. And I've got some more as well. Um, and I'm researching Asia right now. And my, my thought is to, to have a second volume, but there's so much evidence. I might need to split it up into a third volume uh, at this point, but my work keeps growing. So, and I would just mention this too, that the, the beautiful thing about truth is that truth stands up to scrutiny. You know, Paul says we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. If something is true, then further examination and research is going to confirm it. If something's a lie, or the exam examination is going to expose it. It's going to expose the lie. It's going to show contradictions. Yeah, because I didn't know when I started this how good the evidence would be, but, but I've been blown away at how strong it is. And you asked how other tribes' traditions compare to the Genesis flood. And so we don't find perfect traditions. You know, there was a confusion of languages at Babel. They've passed these down orally over thousands of years. But there are enough specific similarities with Genesis, the, the raven and the dove, the 
landing a canoe on a high mountain, the, the rainbow in some cases, the forewarning by God to a prophet or an old man to build a boat and these things. So we have enough specific similarities to see that, yes, they are describing the same flood, the Genesis flood. Now they vary. There are different types of flood stories. There are what we call motifs, the fine earth diver stories, a uh, particular variation on, on, on the Genesis flood count. We'll find, for example, two brothers quarreling, and then there's a flood. We'll find a forbidden tree, something was taken from it, and then there was a flood. And actually, what we see is that these tribes have a, a memory of creation or the Garden of Eden, Cain and Abel, Tower of Babel. And in some cases, they're, they're remembering that, they're remembering the flood, and they're kind of conflating the two. But so we find these different types of flood stories. And actually, when we look at Genesis, the Genesis flood account is the original. It's the one that can explain all the other ones. It's, uh, if, if there was such a thing as Y chromosome DNA of flood legends, Genesis is the ancestral one that can explain all the other ones with these, these elements that are there. Just to kind of summarize that question, um, if Genesis is, is true, this data, all these flood legends are exactly what we'd expect to find. If Genesis is not true, this evidence is the last thing we'd expect to find. That was an excellent analogy, Nick, about how the Genesis flood is sort of like the uh, ancestor of all of these different stories that we find all over the world. And actually, my sister Kaylee was reading a book on poetry about poems around the world, and she read to me the Gilgamesh epic. And what was truly fascinating is how many elements of the biblical account I was able to pick up in that epic. Another thing I find interesting is how similar the creation myths are as well, and you already sort of touched on this. But Nick, can you please tell us about the different creation legends, the Garden of Eden references from around the world, and how they compare to the account of Scripture? So in addition to flood traditions, we find several traditions of creation of the Garden of Eden, uh, even Cain and Abel in the Tower of Babel. The Aztecs, for example, they, they have these ancient paintings of the flood, and, and other nations of Mexico do as well. But the Aztecs also have this painting showing Eve showing this first woman who is likened to Eve and she's talking with a serpent and near her, there are two sons, her, her sons, and, and one is attacking the other. So it's a memory of Eve and, and the serpent and King and Abel. And we find echoes of that in other parts of the, of the, the, the world really. And uh, I'm thinking in particular North America, uh, some tribes in Canada, Greenland, the natives of Greenland said that the first man, Clalak, God took something from him uh, they say his thumb, and then he made the woman. So it, God took the rib from the man and made a baby change it to a thumb. Uh, the Polynesians I'm, I'm researching right now, there are many sources that we find from various islands. They have a, a, a very persistent tradition of the creation of the first man and then God taking a rib from him and making a woman. The Chinese as well have uh, distinct memories of the creation in the Garden of Eden, uh, not only in certain artifacts in ancient documents, but also in their earliest written script, these uh, oracle bone characters, these pictographic characters that when you look at the composition, these different roots or parts of the character, it shows a clear memory of what's recorded in Genesis 1 through 3, and as well as the flood. So you brought up the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about that. And because this is such a popular argument among secularists, you know, you Christians say that the Genesis account is true, but Moses borrowed it. We have this earlier document and it's very similar to Genesis. And so Moses has all you guys deceived thinking that this is true history, but Moses just stole it from a, a Babylonian story. And, and in fact, on my second day of college, I was told by my professor, you know, Moses stole the blood story, right? He plagiarized from the epic of Gilgamesh. And it's a, it's a terribly fallacious argument. And, and I will unpack that a little bit. So, the Epic of Gilgamesh, what is it? it? It's this fictional epic poem, right? It was, think of it as the Shakespeare for the ancient Babylonian world. It's about this strong man, Gilgamesh, he's two-thirds God, one-third man. The gods are like, oh, we made him too strong. Let's send another demigod to fight him. And Kadu. But Gilgamesh defeats him. They actually become friends. They go on adventures together. They fight this, this terrifying beast in the forest, you kill him. But then the, the gods kill his friend, and Gilgamesh is sad very uh, introspective. He goes and talks to Uchinapishti, who's like Noah. He's the one that survived the flood. Uchinapishti tells him the account of the flood. 
And so it's there at the end of the epic that we have this blood count that has some similarities with Genesis. So, but I want to observe uh, one point about the epic, right? So it's it's full of obvious myth and embellishment. And that's fine. It's, it's written for entertainment. That's, that's what it is. Uh, examples, for example, the why was the flood sent? Well, it was sent because the gods couldn't sleep because mankind was too noisy. So they had to kill mankind. What was it like when the flood began? Well, the, the clouds were so dark and terrifying that the gods got scared and they retreated to the highest heaven and were terrified, shivering behind a wall. It has the gods arguing in front of Gilgamesh about why did you let him escape the flood? Uh, so it's full of obvious myth and, and entertainment. Now let's compare that with Genesis. Okay, So Genesis is this, when we look at chapters six through nine, the flood account of Genesis, it's simple, it's sober, it's detailed, and it's historical sounding. We have, for example, records of the, the chronology that Noah, that, Mo, that Noah gives. On this day, the flood began. On this day, the ark began to float. On this day, the depth of the water was measured as, as the ark was grounded on the mountain, and it was 20 cubits deep. And so it, it gives the impression of, of credibility. And you feel like that I'm actually reading a journal written by Noah. But, but anyway, that's, that, that's, the, that's what we have in Genesis, and that's what we have in the epic. So, so we have this sober, simple, detailed, historical sound of the Genesis account. And then we have the epic, which is full of myth and embellishment. So then which came first? So it's real clear from history. Uh, Kenneth Kitchen, I'll read a quote from him. He's a highly regarded Egyptologist, ancient Near East scholar. And he says, I'm an assumption that the Hebrew account is simply a purged and, fallacious and, and simplified version of the Babylonian legend. This fallacious on, methodolog on methodological grounds. In the ancient Near East, the rule is that simple accounts or traditions may give rise to elaborate legends, but not the reverse. In the ancient Orient, legends were not simplified or turned into pseudo-history, as has been assumed for early Genesis. As stated another way, the, the rule is that historical accounts may give rise to legends, but not the other way around. You can go from simple history to, to legends, but you don't go from legends to simple history. So then which came first? Well, it's clear then that Genesis came first. And yet we have history professors saying that Genesis was, the flood account was derived from this Babylonian myth. No, that's a lie. Now, are there any other lines of evidence that could also confirm or deny whether Genesis is the, the earlier account? Yes. And I've had the pleasure of documenting hundreds of these flood traditions, right? And so I've kept a tally. Do they do they match Genesis or the epic? Because there's very, there's very important differences between the epic and Genesis. A few examples are the reason the flood was sent. Epic says it was because mankind was too noisy. Gods couldn't sleep anymore. The shape of the floating vessel, the ark, the, the epic says it was a cube. And the account of the birds, right? And it was raven and dove. It's very different in the epic. Three birds, none of them returned with anything. So which do these native, these indigenous uh, peoples around the world, uh, North America, South America, uh, Asia, Africa, which one do they match? And so you might say, well, the Babylonian epic is earlier, so they must match that. No. They match Genesis and not the epic. Not a single one matches the epic. We can look at those, those point by point differences and they match Genesis. And so someone might say, well, that, that's because Christian missionaries got there and they influenced the natives and they changed their traditions. And so when you recorded their tradition, lo and behold, it sounds like Genesis. No, the, the sources are too early. And see, that's one reason I wrote this book to document it and to take away that excuse. The sources are too many too early. They, they predate not only Christian teaching, in many cases, they predate Christ. Uh, I mentioned Josephus, these ancient traditions. So they're diverse. And then there's indicators of authenticity in the traditions too, uh, native material. It would be very easy to tell if they were influencer. And, and I've screened out those types of traditions. I'm not interested in uh, influence traditions, but where, where they'll, they'll say something like Noah, or they'll mention Jesus or the Trinity, uh, Mary. So but we can tell when there's when there's influence, uh, and it's funny we don't find traditions of other events in the Bible. We don't. Where, where are the traditions of the virgin birth and the Red Sea crossing and the resurrections and so forth? But it, it's also the authenticity of these traditions is confirmed when we look at different language families and their traditions are consistent within language families. So that's another confirmation of their authenticity. But so again, we match Genesis, not yet.
Also, science and history confirms the Genesis flood account. So um, we have embarrassing material about Noah, right? It gives some very embarrassing details about him. It, if you were making it up, it would have been very easy to just airbrush those details. Uh, not so. If there's a commitment to accuracy in, in Genesis. Uh, also, the mountain. You ask these tribes in, in their traditions, and, and they're very impressive traditions, but They'll, they'll, lo they'll localize the mountain. They'll say it was Mount Rainier. It was Pikes Peak of some local mountain. Where did the, where did the ark land? Well, it landed uh, right here on this mountain by us. And, and that's, that's fine, but that's not what Genesis does. Genesis doesn't attempt to localize it. It would, it would have been very convenient to say, well, the ark landed here at Mount Hermon, the, just north of Jerusalem. It doesn't do that. It, it says it landed far away, the mountains of Ararat in Turkey, hundreds of miles away. In, in geology, there, there's, there's several lines of evidence from geology actually confirming Genesis. We find dinosaurs buried next to sharks and deep sea fish. We find marine fossils at every level of the geologic record. Vast sedimentary layers deposited over thousands of miles spanning entire nations, continents, even multiple continents. Flat horizontal layers, the, these sedimentary layers that showing the evidence that they were laid down by water, laid down quickly. And there's there's no soil, there's no bioturbation, there's no erosional channels, channels really, uh, showing that they were laid down quickly. Polystrate fossils also, which span multiple layers, showing us that they were laid down quickly. Uh, curved and bent layers, th these powerful tectonic forces bending them, and there's no cracks or signs of metamorphism showing that, that they were displaced quickly after they were laid down. A and then you look at the, the dimensions of the arc, what does Genesis say? It was 300 by 50 by 30 cubits. Uh, the, the epic, by the way, it, it says it was a cube. Well, good luck surviving in a, a cubical arc. When you look at those dimensions, 300 by 50 by 30 cubits, uh, and en engineers have looked at this in Korea, detailed studies you can look at, perfect dimensions for stability in violent waters. Now, did Moses guess the dimensions, the ideal dimensions by chance? No. Moses got those dimensions because God gave Noah the instructions. You have to build it this way with these dimensions. God, the author of physics. Moses then had Noah's journal, which he used to write Genesis. And we'll talk about that, we'll talk about that more later. Thank you so much for going over the different creation accounts, Nick, from all the other cultures around the world. Nick, one question that usually comes to mind when people are looking at this topic is, well, how can the Bible even be true? Isn't the Bible just another myth? After all, how do we know that Jesus is any different from Zeus or Athena? Nick, the real question is, when we're looking at the Bible, are we dealing with an actual true historical record, or are we dealing with myth or mythical history? So I mentioned some of the geological evidence that confirms Genesis, and, and I'd encourage you to check out the work of Dr. Andrew Snelling and Timothy Clary, excellent creation geologists doing, doing outstanding work. Uh, is Genesis History DVD and Evolution's Achilles Heel, these great resources you can check out, but archaeological evidence confirming Genesis. But myths, you say Genesis is a, someone says it's a myth. Myths don't bury graveyards of dinosaurs next to sharks and deep sea fish. Myths don't deposit these vast sedimentary layers over thousands of miles. Myths don't give the ideal dimensions to build the ark, uh, dimensions which would have been unthinkable to Moses. If, if God hadn't given those instructions. Myths don't have hundreds of traditions confirming that flood account. Truth does, autographs do, eyewitness testimony does. And, and I actually believe Genesis is made up of this eyewitness testimony from the patriarchs in the same way that the New Testament, we have eyewitness testimony of Jesus. And another point I wanna make Christopher is that myths don't have positive predictive value, but truth does. And, and that's actually what we're seeing. And just like you interviewed Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, and we're not just criticizing evolution, but he's developing a, a positive model and we're, and we're seeing predictions and, and the power of a biblical view to build these models. And, and, and I'm excited to really get into that as, as I, when I wrap up data collection of these flood stories, because when you understand that the biblical history is true, we, we have a model to account for these different motifs I mentioned the earth diver motif and these different variations on the flood story and different motifs in folklore that secular anthropologists don't know what to do with. They think they're not connected. The Bible, the Genesis account actually 
connects those and we see stories of creation and we connect those with with eve and and the, the the serpent in the garden these these stories in south america we find for example where a woman is uh tempted by the serpent and and then a flood ensues or a, a forbidden fruit is taken from a tree and then a flood ensues so we have a biblical model that can account for these different stories and it's like joseph said to pharaoh the the dreams of Pharaoh are one. He had, right, Pharaoh had these two dreams of, of the cows and of the ears of corn. They're one. So Joseph had a positive predictive model. Um, and I'm not, I'm not comparing myself to Joseph by any means, but, but anyone with a biblical understanding, we have a model to, to take this data and put it together and say, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. They're connected. The, these earth divers connected to the flood. The, these uh, uh, incestuous marriage is connected to the Genesis account. These, Tower of Babel accounts uh, that we find in large numbers in Western Canada, they're connected to the truth of Genesis. So I'm excited to get into that, that model building as well. Thank you for examining the Bible's historical status, Nick. This next question, in fact, is more along those same lines. Whenever there's a discussion nowadays about the historicity of the scriptural canon, it seems like a discussion about whether the Bible is an A-N-E text or an A-N-E myth, inevitably arises. Nick, what is an A-N-E myth, and are the biblical accounts of creation and the flood A-N-E myths? Yeah, so that's the argument that that the Genesis flood account or the creation account is just another ancient Near East myth. Uh, and I think there's really two questions we got to answer here. One is, what differentiates Genesis from these ancient Near East myths, right? And two, if Genesis is the true one, why do we find so many counterfeits? Uh, isn't it a strange thing that we find so many similar stories to Genesis? If it's true, Babylon, uh, Phoenicia, Egypt, and Greece, and these other places. And so the, the first question, how do we differentiate Genesis from these myths? Uh, I mentioned Genesis stands up to scrutiny, right? It, it withstands cross-examination. We have confirmation from science and history. We have all these traditions confirming Genesis, matching it on particulars, not matching other versions but Genesis they match. And, and then two, why do we find so many parallels then? Well, we shouldn't be surprised because if Genesis is true, then these nations and people groups are going to have a memory of these things. They're going to look back after Babel, after they left the Tower of Babel, their language is confused and they forget some details, but they remember the flood and they remember what they were taught by Noah, that there was this creation in the, in the Garden of Eden Tower of Babel, uh, Cain and Abel, rather, and they, they remember the Tower of Babel itself. So we shouldn't be surprised that they they look back and they would then write about these things that they remembered, just as we find these these stories of the flood around not just the ancient Near East but the world. I'm not I'm not sure that that stories in the ancient Near East are older than those in China, but we find ancient traditions all over the world that confirm Genesis and. I mentioned earlier, and I want to I want to unpack this a bit. That Moses had had records from the from the patriarchs uh, in Genesis five one. Moses says, "This is the book of the generations of Adam." Book what, what book? He's referring to a book. And in eleven places in Genesis, there is a similar phrase with the Hebrew word toledot, which means generations or history or record. And then what follows in that text associated with that is something that is full of details and. It, it, it looks like a written record. We have these genealogies it contains lists of kings, transaction amounts, detailed records of, of events, geographical descriptions. All of this is unnecessary detail if Moses is writing by any means apart from having these records passed down, in fact, by the patriarchs. Uh, so, so Moses had sources. He's not dependent on the some flood story from Babylon. Uh, Moses refers also in Numbers to a book of the wars of the Lord. He, he cites place names and then he gives clarifying details. So, so Moses was a historian. And, um, and by the way, the use of sources does not preclude divine inspiration of scripture. We see Luke writing Luke in Acts um, and interviewing many sources. We, we see the writers of different books in, in the Bible. That's the case. Uh, but, but inspiration allows for the use of sources as, as God is inspiring the author as they're using sources. So, but th there's another fatal flaw of the, the argument of dependence on the Babylonian stories. Uh, secularists ignore the fact that Moses lets us know he had sources uh, and they were 
from the patriarchs themselves. Um, it, it's interesting as you read Genesis, I'm really struck by, you know, events are told in a way that only the direct participants would have told them. Only Jacob would have told it that way. Only Isaac would have told it that way. Only Joseph would have told it that way. And you really see that you're reading family memoirs, family heirlooms in Genesis. If you're on Ancestry.com and you, you may have some distant relative that they upload these memoirs of, of some ancestor, and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm really glad that, that that's really interesting what that person uploaded. Well, it's, it's kind of like that. We have these memoirs, these family heirlooms by, from the patriarchs that are, are, are the substance of Genesis. Joseph, it says that, that his great-grandchildren were born on his knees. So here's great-grandpa, and he's catching the baby. You know, why do you include that? Well, it's because that's what the source said. Joseph got to see his great, great grandchildren, it says. Um, and so, like I say, Genesis, it's inspired, inerrant, God breathed scripture. But um, it's also what I find one of the most powerful evidences of its authenticity, of its historical reliability, is the humanity of Genesis. These memoirs coming through, and it, because in that humanity, we see that we have eyewitness testimony. I, I almost imagine Genesis, uh, Moses sitting there writing and he's like, God, do you really want me to include this detail about Joseph? And God's like, yes, keep it. So anyway, that's, those are a couple of things that differentiate Genesis from these, near, these ancient Near East myths. Nick, before we close this interview, I'd like to take a look at what some of the critics of your ideas have to say. So some might say, well, this is all just coincidental. Or maybe these local flood stories, they've been exaggerated into these epic tales, you know, sort of like how the fish was this big. Nick, how have secularists responded to the presence of these flood traditions? How do they explain them? Yeah, the, the two main arguments that have been made are, well, they just, these myths resemble Genesis by chance. There's something in human psychology that causes us to write stories about floods. Maybe there was some local flood and and they, they exaggerated and it just happened to match Genesis by chance. Uh, and the second argument is that, well, Christian missionaries, Christians got there and they, they changed the beliefs of these natives. And now I, I have a, an article in the appendix of my book refuting those, those two arguments. We, we, the, the, the first argument, the, the specific similarities with Genesis are, are too many. It's, it's not feasible to say that they resemble Genesis by chance and they refer to Noah's raven and the dove and the rainbow and forewarning of, of judgment coming in a flood and you have to build this great boat and take the animals and your family aboard. So that doesn't happen by chance. We don't find hundreds of these by chance. And uh, the second argument that it's the impact of Christian missionaries, uh, I, I mentioned why that's not the case. The sources are too early or too many. There are indicators of authenticity. They even predate Christian arrival. So unless, unless Christian missionaries could use time travel and go into the past and change their traditions, it's, it's really not feasible. And so that's, as much as anything, uh, that's part of why I wanted to write this book is to show that those, those arguments are no longer valid when we look at the data. Nick, we've now arrived at our final question. So we've looked at creation and flood myths from around the world, and we spoke about the design of the ark and scientific evidence for the flood. And so when you step back and take a look at all of it, how does looking at this history and this science boost your faith in the word of God? If you've studied apologetics, you've, you've seen there's a lot of evidence confirming the Gospels, the New Testament, even the Old Testament. But that's also true for Genesis. So to see that we have confirmation from history from these traditions, from even science, archaeology, confirming Genesis, that means that you can trust God's word from the very first book. You don't have to be like, well, I'm reading Genesis. I'm not sure how much is myth, how much is truth. No, God's word is true. It's authoritative. You can trust it. And, and that, I think, gives, it puts you in awe of God and his word. And, and that's one of the most exciting things is when someone reads my book and they say, you know, give me confidence in, in the book of Genesis. And I just, I want to magnify God's word. Um, the flood, when we see that it really truly happened and it was this global flood, just as Genesis describes, it reveals a lot about God's character, about, about divine judgment that, and that God is personal. He judges sin. He sent the flood. He said, you have to get in 
this ark. If you're not in the ark, you will perish. Uh, judgment is coming. And, and the ark is actually, and the flood is a picture of Jesus. Peter says that, that the ark is kind of like a, a, a foreshadowing of Jesus. And you have to be in Jesus to be saved. Unless you're in that perfect righteousness of Jesus, you cannot be saved. Also, I, I think, like I mentioned, truth stands up to scrutiny. And as we see all this confirmation coming in, it's an encouragement for apologetics. Um, and I want to address this objection that you've probably heard that, you know, don't get into apologetics. Apologetics is a waste of time. It's a distraction from the gospel. Just focus on Jesus. Don't get into evidence. Uh, no, that's a false conflict. Apologetics is not a distraction from the gospel. Apologetics removes distractions from the gospel. It doesn't take attention off the gospel. It magnifies the gospel. People are already distracted by their doubts and they can't take the gospel seriously because of their worldview. Uh, Jesus isn't relevant because they were taught evolution. And remember what Jesus said that if I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? So we've got an epidemic of people that cannot trust Jesus on heavenly things because they don't believe him on earthly things. And Jesus and the apostles are very clear that, that Genesis is true, that, th that these events are historical. Um, so apologetics has value to remove those barriers, these intellectual barriers, keeping people from the blinders, keep th keep keeping them from seeing their need for Jesus. So when we can remove those barriers, as it talks about in second Corinthians 10, you know, we're, we're destroying uh, objections and, and uh, every lofty thing and these arguments that oppose the knowledge of God. And we're bringing every thought into obedience to Christ. So, and I've said that if Genesis is not true, Jesus' death means nothing. There's nothing to be saved from. But if Genesis, if Genesis is true, then Jesus' death means everything. We see Paul and the other apostles using apologetics. Uh, while you can't reason someone into the kingdom of God, apologetics is a God-ordained and a Holy Spirit-anointed means that, that we see we're actually called to do. First Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. Uh, to give it a defense. And so we see that it, man, don't let anyone discourage you from getting into apologetics. There, there's never been a greater need for apologetics than now, different views, uh, different teaching that people are being taught. So ultimately it's it's going to lay a foundation for, for people to see the need for Jesus. Maybe you're a pastor and or a youth teacher and you're you're sitting there preparing your sermon. You got your Bible here and you got your coffee, you're at Starbucks gosh, I don't know what to do with Genesis. I don't know if it's true. My professor said it's a myth. You know, I just encourage you that Genesis is true. Uh, Jesus and the apostles thought it was true. We, we have evidence confirming it. Uh, Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. That Genesis is profitable. Having a foundation for the gospel is profitable. And so, you know, as a pastor, you always want to have a finger on the pulse of your people. You got to know what your sheep are eating, what they're being fed, what lies are being told. And so we, we can actually um, address apologetics and give answers to the questions that people have. And it's going to be very helpful. Uh, I mentioned the Is Genesis History DVD, Evolution's Achilles Heels, uh, Genesis Impact. I encourage you to read some of the, the, the great books that are out there by our excellent creation scientists. And lastly, I think this is an encouragement for uh, further work and research. As I mentioned, the the examination of, of something that's true is going to confirm it. And so we, we've, we've got all this evidence coming in confirming the truth of Genesis, uh, but there's a lot of unfinished work and maybe God is calling you to someone listening to get involved in apologetics, maybe pursue further education. And, and, and that's on my heart as well. And do research, get involved. Um, so the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Uh, I encourage you to get into the work. And at the end of the day, it's all about magnifying Jesus and his word. And and I hope that my book can play a small part in that. Amen, Nick. And thank you very much for your time. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Nick's biographical information, his book Echoes of Error at, Evolution's Achilles Heels available at a sales price, and the other articles mentioned in the description. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.